All right. The second thing I should do is to introduce myself properly because not everybody knows me. So my name is Klaus. Um, I've been, uh, what I'm doing, what am I doing for a living? I'm actually a C++ trainer. So this is indeed what I'm doing. I am going to companies, um, computing centers, etc., and talk about C++. So for good reason, this is why I'm now used to sit in front of a, uh, of a laptop and uh, basically talk to, to my screen. Um, this is what I've been doing the, the last weeks. This is to some extent fun, but um, this is why I also definitely appreciate um, seeing a couple of people. What am I doing apart from giving C++ trainings? Well, I um, also do C++ in my free time. So I'm the author of a C++ math library called Blaze. I'm also organizing a user group in Munich. It's also one of the user groups that is currently doing um, virtual meetups. So um, just check out um, what we have to offer. I think in two days, there's the next meetup given by Ben Dean from the S talking about um, the construction of C++ algorithms. All right, so since this is a Zoom meeting, everybody can ask questions at any time. So feel free to ask questions whenever you feel um, uh, I did not really go into detail enough or if, if there's just anything that, that raises your interest. Um, there is, if you know the solid principles, at least five natural points where you can interrupt me. So after each one of these principles, but I also don't mind if you interrupt me in between. No, um, this is definitely not a problem for me. Since I'm probably talking a lot, um, just interrupt me by saying question and then I know pretty well that you want to ask something and um, I'll stop um, when I finish my sentence. So yeah, tonight- Klaus, can, can, I have a, can I have a question? Of course. A general one? General uh, is, is the talk that you are giving now is the one that you submitted for uh, uh, CPPCon? Indeed. So this is what I submitted to CPPCon. I mean, I probably added a little more than I would do at CPPCon. Interestingly enough, there is now 75 minutes for a CPPCon talk. Um, so actually this might work out well, but um, I think due to questions, et cetera, it might be a little longer. I, I, I kind of anticipate it's a little longer, but the topic is the same. And well, I think it's interesting enough for a broader audience. So this is not just for a sub-community or for a particular group of people. I believe actually this is something for every C++ developer. And also we had the uh, survey uh, before, uh, interesting for people from other languages. So people that use Java, C Sharp, Python, et cetera, the sort of principles should be known to every developer. All right, so it, did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. All right. So tonight I'm gonna talk about essentially software design. And just to make clear what I am uh, trying to talk about is, well, this is essentially not really software design yet. This is what I would call a component. Perhaps it's a class, perhaps it's an assembly of classes, but this is not really interesting for my purposes. It starts to get interesting as soon as there's at least one other component. And now this error is indicating what I really have in mind a dependency. So these things use each other, the thing depend on each other. And of course, we would like to um, manage these dependencies well. This is simple, but of course, it can be arbitrarily complex. There can be many components. And of course, you already an anticipated a lot of possible interactions between these components. And this now looks like chaos. This is, of course, something that will prohibit you from doing reasonable software development. It will probably be be frozen, you will not be able to continue to develop this for another 10 years. What you would like to have, of course, is a nice structure, something that people also call architecture. You would like to have guided uh, and, and yeah, ordered dependencies across so-called architectural boundaries. So indeed, as many people say, so for instance, can back dependency is the key problem in software development at all scales. This is what we want to tackle. And this is essentially what the talk today is about, dealing with dependencies. And specifically, it would be nice if there would be a great, a helpful set of guidelines that helps us to tackle these dependencies. And this is now that the real topic, the solid principles. To some extent, I assume that you've heard about them. So very few people um, did not hear about the solid principles at least once, and you probably know at least one of these anyway. Um, 
but I think it is definitely worth to talk about them again, because very often there is some misconceptions what they actually mean. Sometimes people have only a very vague idea of what they really are. Um, and so talking one hour about the solid principles is, despite their age, um, definitely worth um, this time. So there's five of them. Um, the first of these solid principles is the single responsibility principle. The name already suggests a little bit, but unfortunately this name is also something that raises a lot of um, misconceptions. So we definitely have to talk about what a responsibility really is. The second one is called the open close principle. From the name alone, you cannot really guess what this is about, but still it's one of the most important, uh, or so perhaps the second most important of these principles. The third one is called Liskov substitution principle, named after Barbara Liskov, um, basically raised uh, this idea in 1988. Then there is the interface segregation principle. Again, the name gives you some idea what this is about, obviously about interfaces, obviously about segregating interfaces. And the fifth one, the last one is called the dependency inversion principle. This is the five. They have not dropped from the sky, so they are to some extent already old. So for instance, the second and third one both have been formulated or yeah, formulated in some form in 1988. But only one guy um, actually put them together. So Robert Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, in around 2000 decided that this is the five most important object-oriented design principles. This is what he called them. And then approximately three to four years later, Michael Feathers realized that if you arrange them in this order, then the first letters give this nice solid acronym. So this is um, what we still know today. These five principles in this order, this is solved. All right, so I already said that this is traditionally known as the basic object-oriented um, uh, design principles. So. As Wikipedia states, in object oriented pro com computer programming, SOLID is a mnemonic acronym for five design principles. What I want to show you today is that this is not just object oriented programming. Yes, this is where it comes from, and this is, of course, where it can be really nicely applied, but it is more. So I will try to introduce SOLID as a guideline not just limited to all programming, but as a general set of guidelines that we can also apply to functional programming to generic programming, because the fundamental ideas of these principles very, very well also apply to any kind of, any other kind of paradigm. All right. And with this, we are diving into adventure of the solid principles. And of course I do them in order. And the first one is the so-called single responsibility principle. What I wanted to do is I wanted to start with a nice crisp definition of what single responsibility actually is. And so I went to the obvious place to find such a definition, Wikipedia. So this is what Wikipedia has to say about the single responsibility principle. The single responsibility principle states that every module or class should have, a resp have, should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality provided by the software. And that responsibility should be entirely encapsulated by the class, module or function all its services should be narrowly aligned with that responsibility. That is actually a pretty nice statement. It makes you feel you know, kind of cozy. Yes, this is what I want my software to be. However, it also, from my point of view, raises a question. What is a responsibility? So I think this is not making clear what a class really should have only one off. So, one responsibility, all right, but what is it? Commonly, this principle is therefore abbreviated as everything should just do one thing. This is definitely an oversimplification of what SRP really tries to do. Uh, and this is a really hard question. Does my thing do just one thing? Yeah, does a standard vector do one thing? Does a string do one thing? This is very hard to, uh, to answer in general. And so I tried to find a better explanation. And I continued looking for people that know about this. And the next quote is from the book, The Pragmatic Programmer, which I feel is a much better um, uh, summary of what SRP is supposed to be. We want to design components that are self-contained, independent, 
and with a single well-defined purpose. This is where they use cohesion. When components are isolated from one another, you know that you can change one without having to worry about the rest. And you can imagine that it is the second sentence why I like this quote so much. This is exactly what I'd like to have. If I can change things by just changing something in one place, and I, if I do not have to worry about breaking anything else, then I'm actually in a very nice place. Then after a day of work, I can go home, rest uh, assured that nothing is broken. Still, they do not really explain pretty well what this single purpose should be. Yeah, a single well-defined purpose, but luckily they give another word. And I believe this is leading towards what SRP really has in mind. So cohesion. And Tom DeMarco had a nice statement about cohesion that I think um, closes all the gaps that we so far have. Cohesion is a measure of the strength of association of the elements inside a module. A highly cohesive module is a collection of statements and data items that should be treated as a whole because they are so closely related. Any attempt to divide them up would only result in increased coupling and decreased readability. So SRP is not really about it does one thing. It's more like it represents one thing. Essentially, SRP states that everything that does not really belong together should be separated. And only those things that cannot be really separated because they're too tightly coupled, because they simply belong together, these should be kept together. So ultimately, SRP tells us that we should not put everything into one class, but it should we have many small items that hopefully in harmony work together. Now, of course, um, that was Uncle Bob also, Robert Martin. He simply said a class should have one reason to, only one reason to change. That's a very simple, but a very wise uh, sentence or statement, because this is exactly what this, is, uh, what this represents. So let me show you an example. Examples are, are um, definitely helping in understanding. And I have a simple example, a circle class. Okay, okay. I know what you're thinking now. The guy comes with a circle example. Um, this is what everybody's doing. I know this is for some reason is a simple example. I will build on that. Lately, I'm using a lot of circles, I know. Um, but this is so simple that we can focus on the design aspect. So this is indeed a simple circle. It has a radius, uh, is, yeah, a constructor that takes a radius. This is the data member and there may be a couple more data members. So there may be, um, some rotations, some uh, center point, whatever. There is, of course, also a couple of getters, get the radius, get center, get rotation. There is a couple of functions that allow me to translate, rotate, perhaps um, resize the circle in various ways. And then in this example, I also have a function that draws to a screen, that draws to a printer, and a serialized function that puts the circle into byte stream. And so I can transfer the circle to some other uh, system, to some other process, um, to an MPI process, for instance, whatever. There may be more, but this is definitely uh, enough to, to talk about. This class is not adhering to the single responsibility principle. And why? Well, you may think, and you're probably right, that this is primarily because of th these three functions, the to draw and the serialize function. So why are there a problem? Isn't it nice that I can draw a circle in various ways and that I can serialize it? Isn't this what a circle is about or a member function is about creating properties for some kind of thing? So like the circle here, well, Let's think about when does the circle change now? For what reasons does the circle change? So first of all, it will change if the basic properties of a circle change. Well, um, with basic properties, I mean, if we represent it differently. So instead of a radius, we use the diameter or um, something else entirely. I think there is good reason to change these things, that, but I would consider them pretty stable. Yeah, and the geometric entity that what, what a circle represents has been pretty stable for the last couple of million years. So probably this is not changing very often. 
However, it probably changes also when screen changes. Suddenly I have to use, um, I have to rewrite my draw function simply because screen is different. And of course it also might change if printer changes. The interface of printer is now updated a little bit. I have to update my drawing. And the byte stream, of course, poses the same problem. Slightly different, slight change, perhaps a different interface. Um, I need to update the circle. I also would need to change the circle if the way I draw in the first place changes. So for instance, if I want to, um, instead of using OpenGL, I want to use um, Metal Vulcan, simply because it's newer. It also might change because the serialized function changes, because I have to switch from li little to big endian. And I hope you get the point. This circle is changing for various different reasons. Reasons that not have nothing to do with circles in the first place, but with drawing, serialization, and all kinds of uh, auxiliary uh, topics. And this is, of course, something I would like to avoid. I would like to change a circle only, and really only when the circle as such changes, the geometric entity, as I said before. It's probably pretty unlikely. This is perhaps already pretty convincing, but there is perhaps another argument why this, these three member functions are a problem. And that's again, the dependencies. So let's take a look at the dependency graph for the example that we have so far. In the center is a circle and it now has a friend too, it has a square. And these two are for instance required in some overlap calculation. Now, so this overlap component is um, either just giving a true false statement, so do two uh, shapes overlap, perhaps it's computing the area of this overlap, something. Now, shape, uh, overlap only needs to know about these geometric entities, but because of the dependencies that come along with circle and square, it also now knows about screens and printers and byte streams, things that it actually doesn't really need. And unfortunately, there's a transitive dependency now Perhaps I indeed have some effect on changes from screen on overlap. Perhaps not, perhaps I do, but this is of course a dependency that I would like to avoid. And essentially the advice that the single responsibility principle gives me is cutting down these transitive dependencies. So if I consider circle and square as kind of independent things and screen and printer and byte stream, all the other things as separate entities, if I basically put them next to each other, then I can much more easily and more nicely express the real dependencies. Overlap needs to know about circles and squares. Mm -hmm. Drawing, on the other hand, the aspect that I um, really do with circles and, and screens is now explicitly stating that it needs these two. And it's totally independent of, um, of anything that it, so overlap is now independent of anything that it does need. And drawing really expresses the dependencies as it should be. So the drawing aspect is a separate entity and a single responsibility principle gives us an idea about that. Now, SRP is um, not just about classes. In this particular case, I was talking about classes, but let's talk about one function at least to show, yeah, one example uh, that I can show you that is, is definitely more than just a class guideline. And I picked standard copy which I believe is a wonderful example for many things, but also for the single responsibility principle. So standard copy is a function that really does one thing. Now again, this common knowledge interpretation. And when does it change? Well, standard copy changes, not really. It builds on fundamental conventions of the language. So for instance, it uses the um, copy assignment operator, which basically means, um, it would only have to change if really copy assignment would express, it would be expressed differently. That's very unlikely too. So from that aspect, it's very stable. But everything else has been extracted from this function. For instance, memory allocation. Standard copy does not allocate and it is not concerned about allocation at all. You as a caller are responsible to provide an output range that is big enough. You have to provide something um, that copy can copy to. No, something big enough, or perhaps you have a couple of um, um, inserters uh, of any kind that help to do it. Copy is not concerned with memory allocation. And that, of course, again, helps to, um, to deal with one aspect at a time, to not depend on things that are not required, 
and probably the authors, so Alex Stepanov would um, have found a good way to make this work, um, but as such, I think it is really, really beautiful. So as a takeaway at this point, the single responsibility principle is about preferring cohesive software entities. Everything that does not strictly belong together should be separated. And as is already a pretty strong statement, this basically already says that indeed the idea that many people have, unfortunately, to put everything together is wrong from a general point of view, not just object-oriented point of view. All right, are there any questions at this point? All right, then let's go on to the second one, the open closed principle. That one is hard to interpret from the name alone. So I have to tell you what um, Bertrand Meyer in 19, 1988 formulated. Software artifacts, classes, modules, functions, etc., should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So this means that any software that I have should always be extensible. Of course, I want to extend software. Um, I want to build on it. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's called software in the first place. Now I can change things. I can add things. However, when I add something new, I should not have to modify existing code. In a perfect case, I really just want to add code, never want to um, touch anything that already exists. Now, let's take a look at an example for um, the open close principle. And it's now a slightly longer example, but I think uh, I found a good way to talk you through that. We start with an enumeration. Now we have several kinds of shapes, again, circles and squares. And for them, I have reserved enumeration that really names them all. Well, I have two at this point. Additionally, now I would like to have an abstraction in place. Some abstraction allows me to, for instance, store several kinds of shapes in a vector of shapes. So I have a base class. The base class is a little special, something that you might not have expected. The base class in the constructor takes one of these enumerators and stores it in its private part. And well, then as the, the getter, I can get um, the shape type. So I basically remember what I am. The circle class now inherits from shape. So circle is a shape and the circle probably initializes the shape with a circle enumerator. So now I remember I am a circle, pretty okay. Then there's of course all the other stuff that you've seen before. There's a radius, other data members, the according getters. What I've done now, however, is I've moved stuff outside. So translate, rotate, and my toy uh, draw are now outside of circle, which is reasonable. This is essentially what the single responsibility principle just before told us. Um, so this should work well. Circle has a friend, circle has the square too. Um, there's just one big difference. Um, that is that, of course, the square initializes its base class with the square enumerator. Else, of course, things would go terribly wrong. So this is the primary change. Else, uh, a circle is pretty similar to uh, a circle. It also can be translated, rotated, and drawn. Again, consistently here in this example, I choose free functions um, in order to satisfy the single responsibility principle. Now I want, as I said before, draw shapes in it in an abstract fashion. So let's say that I have a draw function that has a vector of unique pointers. So I have a lot of shapes. I want to draw each one of them. How do you do it? Well, of course, first by traversing um, all the shapes. So range based for loop, go over all the shapes. Single shape is now called S. And now I have to ask, what kind of shape is it? This is why I store the, um, the type so I can ask this type and based on the type, I can cast to the right kind of shape. And I'm actually absolutely sure that it's the right thing. Um, so I get the type or, I, or um, I get the pointer, I cast it accordingly. If it's a circle, I cast a circle. If it's a square, I cast a square. 
And this works pretty nicely. And then just a, a quick glimpse on the main function. Um, I have a vector of unique pointers here that I fill with circles, squares, probably many more, because three is not enough in the, in the usual case. And if I call draw, I indeed see the according output of, um, of every function. All right, great. Now let's return to the OCP, the open close principle. This example is broken with respect to the open close principle if I want to add a new kind of shape. Let's imagine, as a toy example again, that I would like to add a rectangle. Well, what do we have to do when we add a rectangle? First thing, we have to extend the enumeration. This is already something that would consider a problem because this is a central point of truth. Everything apparently in this example depends on the shape type, a very strong dependency. You change the shape type, you might uh, change a lot of other things as well. So it's not two values anymore, now it's three. Perhaps this changes the underlying type. Um, and of course, because I know this uh, enumerator in or this enumeration in a lot of places, I might have to change things in, in, in many other places. So the circle at least has to recompile. The square, because it knows the enumeration too, has to recompile. And of course, I have to touch draw, a draw function. I have to add another case statement. So in case it's a rectangle, I have to do the right static cast. I cast a rectangle and I draw accordingly. Now, the problem here is not that I have to re recompile draw. This is something I have to do anyway, probably. But the problem is that I have to touch so many places. How many four um, floops do I have that contain a switch statement? Or even more simpler, how many switch statements do I have that now need to be updated? In a bigger framework, this can be dozens, perhaps even hundreds of switch statements that I now have to touch. So adding a new kind of shape may be a nightmare scenario for, for, any, for every maintainer. This is definitely clear breaking of the open close principle. So what can we do better in this case? Um, and I believe you have thought about the, the probably right solution for the last, say, 10 minutes, no, five minutes. It didn't take me that long. You were thinking like, why an enum in the first place? There is some a feature that helps us here, virtual functions. Well, I should make a point that um, the virtual function is definitely a good um, solution here. The enum solution is still used because of the performance. There's something I don't go into detail here. I've done another talk on that topic, but um, the virtual keyword is, um, is kind of a solution now. So, in the base class, I now introduce a virtual translate, a virtual rotate, and a virtual draw. You note that there is no enumeration anymore. So it's totally gone. So I do not have to initialize my base class. I, do not, uh, have, I don't have any kind of data member because I don't need to store anything. It's now a classic interface. So circle, again, inherits from shape. Doesn't have to initialize it, though. Um, however, it now needs to override the uh, three pure virtual member functions. And a square does the same thing. So it does not have to initialize its base class anymore. There's nothing to initialize here, but it needs to override, translate, rotate, and draw. And this definitely helps with regard to the open close principle. The draw function suddenly becomes really, really beautiful, really simple. So what do I do to draw a shape? Well, I call draw. And I do not care about the actual type. I do not care about any types of shapes at all in this function. I just call the right virtual function. And so indeed, for the, from the point of view of the open close principle, this is a perfect solution. I do not have to touch many, many places anymore in order to do my drawing. I can now add a rectangle without having to, uh, uh, having to modify the draw function at all and many other functions uh, also. So nothing changes down here. I basically now enable me to very easily add new types. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Except for one tiny flaw that you might have noticed, and it might have raised a big 
question mark in the back of your mind. Didn't I just say that we should, should not have the draw function as a member function? Now it's back in the class as a virtual function. So isn't this a violation of the sync responsibility principle? Oh yes, it is. It is exactly the same violation that we have dealt with before. But now we're back here with the argument that the open close principle is satisfied by making this a member function. And perhaps to some extent, this is now a little bit confusing for you. It should be confusing because after all, these other principles were introduced as basic object oriented design principles. This is, I would argue, classic object-oriented programming, and it does not satisfy all of these solid principles. No, actually it does not. This should be surprising, and it should also raise a big uh, exclamation mark in the back of your mind. You should now think, oh my, it is not that simple. Object-oriented programming is really difficult to get right. I have to think about a lot of things. I have to consider a lot of details. So one of the things I'm trying to do lately in, in several talks I have given and will give hopefully is to point out that indeed there is better solutions today. Question, yes. Go ahead. Okay. So one of the points I'm trying to do uh, to make is that there is new solutions. There is simpler solutions. We have actually already a solution that allows us to follow both the open close principle and the single responsibility principle. And I know this is now a little more complex. It looks like it is more complex, but still I want to draw your attention to a solution that we call type erasure. So in this solution, we approach the problem completely differently. The first thing we do again is we write a circle, but note the circle does not have a base class at all. It's just a circle. And it's the simplest kind of circle that you can imagine. It stores a radius, it has a center point, whatnot, a couple of getters, nothing complex. Again, I am using the free functions. And why not? It's the right thing. I do not couple aspects like drawing to a simple thing like circle. So this may, of course, be provided in a different file, totally different aspect uh, for simplicity. It's not just listed uh, directly behind. The square is the same thing again. So it's again, similar to, to circle. Um, it does not inherit from the base class or for any base class, and it just provides the free functions as it should be. Now, the additional functionality that I can add easily. Now type erasure is based on one idea that I now represent in a class called shape. There is a shape again, but this time indeed it's not a base class. It's more like a container that can take anything that behaves like a shape. And now I go over this a little more quickly because this is not the main aspect, but I want to point out why this is a very nice solution with respect to SRP and OCP. So I start with telling you that in the private part of shape, I actually define a class template that is traditionally called model. And this model is storing any kind of T, any kind of T that can be translated, rotated, and drawn. As long as the type T can provide these three functions, it is a shape from my point of view. I express this explicitly by inheriting from a base class, which I call concept. This concept-based class is also in the private part of shape. It comes with a lot of virtual functions, and it essentially represents a traditional interface class. It just renamed the functions to not cause confusion. It also simplifies things a little bit. So there's a do translate, a do rotate, and a do draw. This is the things that shapes need to be able to do. Everything that can be translated, rotated, and drawn is a shape. Now, I store one of the things by means of a concept pointer, cleverly, smartly, like uh, in form of a unique pointer inside the, the shape. The next thing is that I provide the same interface for shape that I would expect on any other kind of type. So translate, rotate, draw. 
I would like my things to be translatable, rotatable, drawable, and so I should be I should be able to do the same thing with the shape. These functions merely forward the request to translate to the actual thing that I store inside. So this is the pointer, it calls the virtual function, and via the virtual function, I go back to the actual type that I store inside. Based on this mechanism, that was now the five minute version of type erasure, I'm now actually able to store anything inside a shape. Anything, any T. Give me some T, as long as I can translate, rotate, and draw it, I'll take it. It will not compile if I cannot do these three things, which is a very nice property. But as soon as it does, everything's fine. And I store it in the abstract fashion. I uh, store it by means of the concept pointer. I see new model here. So the, I need the special member functions. I need a couple of other things too. Um, but essentially, this is uh, now what I have. There is a draw function, again, for a vector of shapes. But this time, I do not have pointers anymore, but values. Now, a shape contains something, it can be a circle, it can be a square, and so I do not really need the pointer anymore. This becomes simpler. And I simply ask the shape to be drawn. So this is the draw function that now triggers a virtual function call and calls the according function um, in, in a shape. But remember, I do not really implement how things are drawn inside the shape. I merely forward the request to another free function. So, and just to really express how beautiful the solution can be, we look at the main function, there's no pointers anymore. There's no inheritance anymore. There's no virtual functions visible anymore, uh, no memory allocation visible anymore. All of the things are nicely hidden. And so from a usage point of view, this is really tremendously beautiful. So I totally know that this is a very, very quick um, introduction to type erasure. It's not a good introduction, most, most more like a, okay, look, we have better solutions today. I have covered a couple of more details in another talk that I've given in the London C++ user group recently called Embrace No Paradigm Program. Um, in this talk, I essentially compared a lot of different solutions, a lot of different approaches how we can draw shapes. This hopefully sounds more boring than it actually was. Um, I compared different, seven different approaches and rated them from one, very bad, to nine, very good. The two that are now of interest are these two, the OO-based solution and the type erasure solution. So traditionally, OO programming indeed is very good in terms of addition of shapes. So this fulfills the OCP. But unfortunately, the easy, the naive approach is not particularly good with respect to SRP. Thanks to type erasure, I am actually able to, first of all, from my point of view, it was, a, of course, a subjective um, uh, rating. The OCP is improved even more. But suddenly SRP is back in the game. I also adhere to the single responsibility principle. And that's simply because I am now uh, not forced to inherit from any, um, from any base class anymore. I am not forced to override any kind of function. I have now the option to completely externally provide all the functionality that I need. I need a draw, well, I can provide it in any way I seem fit. I can implement the function in exactly this form. I can also add a couple of more parameters that I default. I can implement this function as a template. There is no strict dependency on a particular um, um, form. So in other words, uh, there is no strict requirement, the requirement that a virtual function usually gives me. So this is why I am much freer, much, it's much more loose coupling. And this, definitely can help to, to untangle certain un, um, inheritance relationships. I, have, I would also would like to mention that I have talked about this also in 2017. The talk was called Free Your Functions. And also at this point, I was already talking about single responsibility and open close principle. Um, I tried to make the point that in general, it is a good idea to have free functions, yeah, because this makes it easier to change and to extend things. Some people liked the talk very much, some did not. Um, it probably depends on um, the system that you're in. But hopefully with, in, in combination with this type ratio, um, I could again make a good point that loose coupling is usually better and superior 
um, to the tight coupling that inheritance gives us. All right, hopefully this was an idea, uh, gave you an idea about the open close principle. I want to be, to be able to change things, uh, sorry, to extend things easily without having to add anything um, somewhere else. And now we can indeed, with the solution I've shown, add new types without having to modify any existing code. Very good. However, again, it applies to functions also. So again, I pick on the uh, copy function, which is um, serving for many, many things. Also, this copy function is a nice example for OCP. Do I have to change the copy function if I add a new type? Well, not as long as I just base everything on the fundamental um, mechanics of the language, a certain specified interface. So as long as the type adheres to the required concept, as long as it can properly copy it, and as long um, as, yeah, this is what I also mentioned a little later, as long as these here are totally fulfilled, I can actually copy the thing. I don't have to change the copy function just because I have a new type. So it is closed with regard to new types. This is exactly what I'd like to have. So I can use the same argument also for generic code. So the takeaway for the OCP is that you should prefer software design that allows the addition of types or operations without the need to modify existing code. But I should stress again that usually when we are talking about dynamic polymorphism, we have to make the choice to either, either be able to add types or operations easily. So unfortunately, there, there is nothing that would give you both. A static polymorphism, yes, but not in dynamic polymorphism. There's something that you have to, to keep fixed. Um, also something that Kilian talked about in the London Music Group last time. So he showed a nice list of um, so basically all the possible combinations, closed sets and open sets, but there was no combination of open set for types and open set for operation. It doesn't exist, unfortunately. All right, any questions about the open close principle? Klaus, um, I wanted to ask if uh, maybe uh, do you think that uh, um, the concepts in, in C++20, uh, do you think this, this uh, new uh, uh, you know, notion in the language, does this help uh, with, uh, with design? Does it, will it help us uh, uh, write better, uh, you know, cl better code uh, uh, adhering to these uh, uh, principles? So I go back one slide to the copy function. I think that concepts are indeed a big, big step forward. Because right now, input it is just a name. And I personally associate a couple of operations, but the compiler does not. So with concepts, we have an ability to basically make it clear in code that a concept is very, very similar to base class. It is a set of requirements that I'd like to check at compile time. But again, concepts are a little more loosely coupled than a base classes would be. And so um, I think it's a very big step forward. Does it help to automatically use the solid principles? Not automatically. So a concept is, um, it has basically the same problems as a base class. It needs to nicely represent um, a common set of operations. And this is one of the reasons why we probably need five years to really understand what is a good concept. Um, but once you have that, um, perhaps it, it helps. So I would, in short, probably not directly, but it's definitely a big, big step forward. All right, other questions? In between questions. All right, then with three more to go, we are now at the third one, the so-called Lisk of substitution principle. And I stated before that this was um, uh, described by Barbara Lisk of 1988. And this is what she said in her uh, publication in, uh, from 1988. What is wanted here is something like the following substitution property. If for each object O1 of type S, there is an object O2 of type T, 
such that for all programs P defined in terms of T, the behavior of P is unchanged when O1 is substituted for O2, then S is a subtype of T. So if you're not confused and uh, have to read it a second and perhaps even a third time, then uh, don't worry anymore. Ms. Liskov is a mathematician. She has to talk in this kind of um, sentences. What she really has in mind in a much simplified form is subtypes must be substitutable for the base types. This is of course mathematically not even closely, uh, as close as hers to be correct, but um, this is essentially what the Liskov substitution principle is about. Substitutability, so-called behavioral subtyping, or in a short form, an is-a relationship. An is-a relationship implies, first of all, that all the arguments of methods are contravariant and the return types in the subtypes are covariant. This, for instance, means that if you can return in a subtype from any function something that is a little more specific than what is requested in a base class, and you can accept something that is less specific in the functions as, as arguments. The same thing holds also true for preconditions and postconditions. So preconditions cannot be strengthened Postconditions cannot be weakened. Uh, it's basically the same relation as with um, the function arguments and uh, return types. And invariance of the supertype must be preserved in a subtype. So essentially, this means that adhering, so the list of substitution principle is adhered to if the deriving class behaves as expected. If you have a certain set of expectations in your base class, if you expect a certain behavior, then the deriving class must adhere to this particular behavior. All right, having said that, I have a question for you. I have a selection of two implementations. First of all, I should state this is a pretty common um, example. Common in the sense that it's perhaps even a, a real classic by now. If you know that, just lean back uh, for approximately one minute and enjoy the show. Let the others think about uh, these two implementations. The question is, which one would you choose? All right. So here's the two examples. On the left-hand side, I have option A. So there is a square. Well, a square, I know yet again, a square has width. So first as a data member, and then of course, it also has the according setter, set width. It also has a get area function, which as you might expect, returns the area as return width times width. Well, that's the width of a square, quite naturally. And there may be more inside the square. This is the three things that we are interested in, these two functions and this data member. Then there is a class rectangle. The rectangle class publicly inherits from square because essentially it shares a common property with the square, the width. However, it also introduces something new. So I now basically add functionality. I introduce a set height function. The set height function, of course, sets a new data member that is introduced in rectangle, the height. So set height sets the height set width sets the width. You can now imagine that get area is of course incorrect in the context of a rectangle. I have to override it. I now override it and it now returns uh, width times uh, height. Now exactly what you would expect. Now everything um, is probably working anymore. This is option A. In option A, I basically extend the base class and add new things. Option B on the right hand side is to some extent the inverse. I start with the rectangle class. And well, a rectangle has two side lengths, which I call, which I call width and height. There's a set width, there's a set height, and of course the set width sets the width and the set height sets the height. There is again a get area function, which um, computes the area as right, return width times height, yeah, just as what you would expect. Again, there may be a little more. This is the things that are really interesting for us. 
Then there is a square function, uh, uh, square class, of course. It publicly inherits from a rectangle. Now, a square is, of course, a little less than a rectangle. A square only has one side length, but a rectangle already is two. Which means in this version, I have to kind of restrict the rectangle base class. I do that by overriding both set width and set height. Now set width sets both the width and the height. So if I call set width, both the data members are changed. And if exactly the same happens if I call set height. Both width and height are changed. If I'm making absolutely certain that width and height are the same or equal, then get area is um, doing the right thing. A return width times height will uh, give me the, the right area. But of course, I'm free to over, also overwrite this in any way I seem fit. So option B is kind of restricting the, um, the base class. Now, think about this for approximately five more seconds. I've talked a, long, uh, a little bit now. Which one of these would you choose? Which one seems more obvious? Now, this is an example that I also use in my um, teach uh, in my in my C plus trainings, and I would argue that approximately eighty to ninety percent of people choose option B. Why option B? Well, very likely because this is the option that, well, the mathematically correct option, right? A square is a rectangle, and it's not the other way around. So the left one just doesn't feel right. It's the right one. So this is where I would definitely like to have a poll to um, perhaps 80% um, of you knew the example already, um, but then at least the other 20%, I would be very, very curious to see which option you have chosen. So why did I ask you this? Well, of course, there is a, a tiny little trap inside. Option B sounds like exactly the right choice. Option B sounds like, um, well, the math, uh, from a mathematical point of view, correct thing. And option A is just weird. However, unfortunately, option B does not satisfy the Liskov substitution principle. For a very interesting reason. Because I have to overwrite set width and set height in a square class. I actually cannot satisfy the expectations in a rectangle anymore. The expectation in a rectangle is that I can set width and set height independently. So if I have a rectangle, I call set width with a four and I call set height with a seven. Then I would expect that get area returns seven times four. Unfortunately, this is no longer true if it is not a real rectangle, but a square because the set width and the set height have both set both data members, I end up with seven times seven. This is exactly what the Liskov substitution principle is about. It tells us that this is the kind of inheritance that will backfire at some point in, um, in, in, in its use. Very, this is a very dangerous thing. Now, if you have picked option A because it seems like a nice thing to extend something, I have to disappoint you. Also, option A unfortunately violates the Liskov substitution principle essentially for the same reason. The expectations of the on the base class are not met. The square base class, my expectation on, this, on a square is that it has one side length and if I call it width, both the width and the height kind of change. But unfortunately, this is no longer true if it's suddenly a rectangle. Suddenly it has two side lengths. And again, a call to get area might give me weird, unexpected results. This example is not to annoy people or to, to prove math to be wrong. No, this example is to, to make the point that base classes are really tricky to get right. We really have to think about this LSP, this list of substitution principle, in order to find the right kind of abstraction. In this example, as long as I have individual setters, so as long as there's these two here, it will not work. I cannot make it work. Perhaps in computer science, a rectangle and square do not really, should not really form an inheritance hierarchy. 
perhaps there should be a shape that is a very abstract form. But from an, OC, uh, for, from an LSP point of view, um, these two functions should definitely not, um, these two classes should definitely not form a hierarchy in this form. Now, this is the traditional idea of LSP. It gives us a restriction on inheritance hierarchies. There really is a relationship needs to meet, meet a couple of, of um, rationales, so a couple of requirements. However, we can also apply LSP to templates, of course, because also here there is a substitutability. If the copy function is called with proper iterators, all my expectations are met and it will do its, uh, its job properly. If, however, the operations that I call inside are not doing what I expect, if they're doing something weird, if some precondition is violated due to that, then of course copy will not do its dry, uh, job right. So also here, LSP can be applied, not to the function, but definitely to the input uh, arguments. As also first, last, and this. The types need to provide me with the right kind of um, operations, and these have to meet my expectations. Okay, so the takeaway from the LSP, the list of substitution principle is, first of all, if you're using an inheritance hierarchy, make absolutely sure that inheritance is about behavior, not about data. As soon as you have a single virtual function, which is not just the, uh, the destructor, uh, make sure that inheritance really is about behavior and that you meet the expectations. And these expectations are often also called contracts. So make sure that the contract of base types is a tier two. If not, very surprising things may happen. And of course they happen in the, in the worst uh, point in time, probably when you do not have a lot of time to fix this anyway. If you're using templates on the other hand, make sure to adhere the required concept. This is the requirement here, the expectation. As long as you adhere to the required concept, and I basically also mean C++ concept, um, C++ 20 concept, um, everything works as expected. All right, any question about the list of substitution principle? I think I have a comment, not really a question. Right. Uh, just, to, <clears throat> just to clarify, the list of substitution principle basically talks about API design, the API of your class. So. The requirement. It doesn't uh, really matter how you implement your class. It Correct. talked about what methods go where. And I think your example is excellent in showing that there is no solution when the, and the problem is the methods. It's not our mathematical notion of geometry of what a rectangle, that a rectangle is uh, uh, its relation to a square or is a square a type of rectangle in a system. We have to think about the API, the contract and not what the, the notion of an object is. That, that's why it's not really only about object orientation, it's about API design. Yeah, I totally agree. Sharp end. Yeah. I would suggest uh, functionality maybe more than data. Exactly, this is what it's about. I, I hope this was becoming clear. It's not, uh, so, if I inherit, I have to make sure that the functionality is properly implemented, that these expectations are met. I do not inherit to get a little bit of data from the base class. Uh, this is what I see often. This is why I stress it um, perhaps more than I, than I have to. Um, it is indeed about, as, as um, Adi just said, about the, um, the, 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 the semantics. It's about semantics. semantics. Correct. And, and that's why it's bigger than OOP. Absolutely. OOP just yep. makes it very tempting to make things that merge semantics and, and nice data sharing and stuff like that. But yep. it's about semantics. It's not about sharing concepts. And, and the concept example shows exactly the same thing, why it has nothing to do with object orientation. It's, it's about yep. using the correct concept. If this is the takeaway for everybody, great. This is what I want to show. Uh, so it's not just it's great example. Yeah. All right, other questions?
All right, then let's join me for the fourth of these principles, the so-called interface segregation principle. Now, Ralph Martin simply said, clients should not uh, be forced to depend on methods that they do not use. Wikipedia says, many client-specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. So apparently this is about, indeed, as the name suggests, segregating interface into many interfaces. Now I have one example that uh, I want to show you, one example that builds on the um, things that we've done before. We had a circle and a square. We were trying to draw them properly. And of course, there is also the classic OO solution. So I showed you the object-oriented solution um, where the draw was inside, but of course, it is a reasonable idea to extract draw also. And this is what we usually do by means of the strategy design pattern. Now, so the strategy design pattern is one of these 23 classic design patterns that the Gang of Four introduced in a book in, from 1995. It is one way how you can extract functionality. So I, this is copied from the book. I give these names that we can um, uh, appreciate, for example. So in our shapes, I have the draw aspect, but they do not want to have the implementation details of draw inside the shape. So I now extract them. And I introduce a draw strategy uh, base class. This is where I um, introduce a pure virtual draw function again. And I can now implement the strategy in various ways. I can have the OpenGL strategy, a metal strategy, a Vulcan strategy, many, many different strategies. The shape is therefore three, free of the, of the implementation. It does not have to know about drawing at all. It is simply given, and it is what, what this area here indicates, it is given a strategy by a constructor or by means of some setter. This is then called dependency injection. And it henceforth, whenever draw is called, forwards the request to the according strategy. Now, let's take a look at um, how this can look in code. I start with introducing the strategy, and I call it draw strategy. It's a strategy that um, allows me to draw circles and squares. Again, I have my shape base class. Okay, with animation. The shape base class, nothing changed here. It's exactly the same base class that we've seen in the OO solution before. And I have a very, very similar circle still. There's one change now. One change that unfortunately makes this look a little more complex. In the constructor, I do not just get the radius, but I also get some kind of strategy. So a draw strategy. I don't know what it is. Could be OpenGL, could be a metal strategy, but I actually don't care. This strategy, of course, nicely managed by unique pointer, is now moved into my data member. Uh, I now own the strategy. And whenever draw is called, I now forward my request to the strategy. So I now know how to draw myself. The square also is given a draw strategy. So it's basically the same change in the constructor. I am given a unique pointer to draw strategy. I move it into my data member. And whenever a draw is called, I use the draw strategy. Now, in this particular case, I have already, perhaps again, surprisingly violated this interface segregation principle, probably accidentally. The draw strategy here is violating the interface segregation principle because I have baked together two things that do not belong together. Imagine what would happen now if I would use this draw strategy and if I would come up with a new kind of shape. Again, let's use a rectangle. I would introduce a draw rectangle at this point. This, however, means that, well, because the strategy is visible virtually everywhere, that the circle is affected, that the square is affected. Again, I have polluted all the classes, all the kinds of shapes that I have with a dependency on draw strategy. This is exactly what should not be. I should have an interface that is focused on one thing and one thing only. So according to the interface segregation principle, I should have two interfaces. So draw circle strategy and draw square strategy. If this now terribly sounds like um, the single responsibility principle, I actually agree. 
I feel that the interface aggregation principle is to some extent a special case of the single responsibility principle. It is just focused on one special but a very important case. I especially highlight this because indeed my experience is that people do not think a lot about things. So about the, this, this particular principle. There's two draw functions. They're similar. They have the same name, they do the same thing. Why not put them into one class? And immediately I have actually messed up um, this interface aggregation principle. So there should be one particular strategy for every possible shape. And now of course you can go ahead with every new shape, I introduce a new uh, strategy and now it works pretty nicely. But of course now this raises um, this red flag. You see this proliferation of base classes. This is the unfortunate downside of the interface aggregation principle or the style of programming in its entirety. And I point again at the um, um, type and race solution that we've seen before. I do not have a proliferation of tiny base classes. I just implement things very naturally, very, very easily. So ISP is also nicely resolved by that. Okay, I should... Um, uh, finish my animation. Now, of course, the circle gets a draw circle strategy uh, and stores it accordingly, and the square gets a draw square strategy. Now, the names become a little more cumbersome, but ultimately, now I have resolved the dependencies properly. So, interface segregation is about separating interfaces again, separating things that do not belong together. But again, this is not just something that I can only use for um, base classes. This is again, the, the traditional use case, but again, we can use it for functions also. And yeah, no, it starts to get boring, but I can again use this for copy. It is about these concepts again. Standard copy does not put a lot of burden on your types. It is using the concepts that require the least of your types. So I can implement copy but just by, by means of just an input and an output iterator. I don't need a bidirectional or random access iterator. It's the minimum requirements on your interface. So this is essentially what the interface integration type principle tries to do. Put as few burdens, as few requirements on you as possible. Yeah? Cutting down the, the requirements. And well-designed uh, concepts can do the same thing. Yeah, so think about which requirements a template parameter really brings with it. So the takeaway here is make sure interfaces don't induce unnecessary dependencies. All kinds of interfaces. Interfaces in the sense of base classes, but also interfaces in the sense of concepts, which essentially are also some kind of interface, some kind of requirement. All right, any question about um, the interface segregation principle? All right, then the last one, which is unfortunately the most complex one. Um, you may have dealt with this before, and this is really always confusing people. What is exactly the purpose of dependency inversion principle? I'll try to explain it also with a real world example. But again, I start with a quote from Robert Martin, the one who put together these uh, five principles. He said, the dependency inversion principle, DIP, tells us that the most flexible systems are those in which source code dependencies refer only to abstractions not to concretions. Indeed, if I depend on concrete things a lot, things that change a lot, then small changes may have a huge effect on my code. I might have to change a lot of other things. And so abstractions are definitely the code, the, the, the key to, um, to successful software development, especially long-term development. There is one more thing that is usually really um, confusing people. One addition to what he said, point A, high level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. And abstractions should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. 
And this is very, very abstract in itself. So I try to explain this by means of an example. So let's say that, no, this is the first example without circles and squares. I hope you're happy. Um, on the left-hand side, I now have a user and the user is asking for permissions on the right-hand side. User, however, in this example now depends on a concrete implementation. The permission changes often, user has to be updated often. This is what I'd like to prevent. And I'd like to prevent it because perhaps my architectural view is that a user is more like a high level thing and permissions is more like low level implementation details. I would like to avoid to depend on the low level. So the high level should not depend on the low level. It should be the other way around. Very often you read, even in new publications, that the dependency version principle is very easy to resolve. You just have to provide an abstraction here, perhaps in form of a base class. So I introduce the permissions interface. And indeed, this error here is now pointing in the other direction. This is already starting to look a little bit like an inversion of dependencies. And indeed, the user is now depending on something that's hopefully much more stable than the implementation details, the interface. However, from an architectural point of view, this is unfortunately not really a, um, a dependency inversion. It is not enough to just introduce a base class. The question is, where does the base class reside? This is not a dependency inversion because uh, architecturally, I might still have an, uh, so a, a component on the left-hand side, a component on the right-hand side. The right-hand side component has these two things. And so the high level still depends on the low level. The entity's um, component depends visibly on the authorizer component. I would like to invert this architecturally. And so all I need to do is I need to Im implement, I need to give the permissions interface to the site that actually um, you should depend on. So I'm moving the permissions interface to the left side. From a code point of view, it's exactly the same, but architecturally, from a design perspective, it is now fundamentally different because now the user is the owner of the interface. The user is not depending on the interface anymore, the user specifies the interface. This interface is now a specification of all the requirements for acquiring permissions. So the user spells out an interface, this is what I'd like to have, and somebody else implements this and of course depends on these requirements. If the requirements change, the implementation needs to change. This is what is known as an I need interface. The other kind of interface, the interface we had before, this is called an I do interface. An I do interface is an abstraction of implementation details. Here it is a specification of requirements only. And now we really have a dependency inversion. Architecturally, the error, visibly is pointing from right to left. Now indeed, the low level depends on the high level specification. This is actually not, um, not a small thing. So I now show you an example from the real world, a so-called model view controller. In order to make sure that we're talking about the same thing, uh, that everybody knows what I have in mind when I say model view controller, I copied the Wikipedia page so a model view controller, first of all, has a controller that manipulates some kind of model. The model does something with the input data and it gives this to some kind of view, which again informs the user about um, the changes. So it's a nice system. Um, the controller gives data to the model and the model gives some data to view. So architecturally, in order to make this work properly, I really need this dependency inversion. So first of all, I define an architectural boundary. I want to be able to add different kinds of controllers, different kinds of use, but my business logic, the high level, should not be affected by any kind of control of view. It should be independent. On the left-hand side, I have dependency from controller to model. This is good, this is natural. It follows the data flow. But on the right-hand side, I actually want a dependency that is against the data flow. So the view should depend on the model. 
Although, of course, the model gives the data to the view. That is only possible to solve by means of the dependency inversion. I need to invert it by providing interfaces in the center of my architecture, so within the model. The outside world needs to depend on the model in order to guarantee that the model is truly independent. That the requirements can be changed whenever necessary, that not the model changes because of that, but the outside world. This is how plugins work. This is how um, essentially all kinds of um, uh, add-on interfaces or add-on architectures, I have to say, work. Without the dependency version principle, this not, would not really work well. So I know this is a little confusing, perhaps because it's a lot of context and suddenly we're talking about architecture, um, which is nothing else but design on a perhaps slightly higher level. Uh, there is a book from Robert Martin, uh, Clean Architecture, where also states architecture is just design. It's nothing different. We just use different words here. However, again, you might get the impression that um, it's just for base classes again. No, it's not. It is also something that it can adhere, uh, uh, use for uh, functions also. And again, for the last time, I promise, because it's the last principle, I use the copy function. It just serves so for so many um, explanations. This copy function is also dependency inverted. You do not see a lot of technical difficulties here or technical um, tricks, it just is by means of the concepts. A concept and a base class are conceptually very, very similar. Technically, they're not, but conceptually, they're similar. They specify requirements. The input iterator now is also a specification of requirements, which in this example, in case of the copy function, however, is owned by copy. Copy itself specifies which uh, operations you need to provide. It's not you, it is copy itself. And because copy specifies what operations it requires, you depend on the copy function, which is of course, if you think architecturally, a very, very important thing for a standard library. The standard library cannot depend on your code. You need to depend on the standard library you know, or that standard library needs you to depend on it. This is easily achieved by means of concepts. So the dependency inversion principle is at work here. It just looks a little different and it looks a little simpler perhaps. All right, so it is again um, the concepts that help here. So the takeaway is to prefer to depend on abstractions which may be abstract classes, but also concepts instead of concrete types. And think about who should depend on who, which is the right direction of dependencies. So essentially the dependency inversion principle helps you to steer the dependencies in a certain direction. And only by that, you may be able to really define an architecture. So, which slowly but steadily brings me to the end of my talk. We've talked about all of these solid principles by now, and hopefully you've seen that all of them have something to do with dependencies. And hopefully you've also seen that all of these principles are pretty universally applicable. It is not just um, OO stuff. Indeed, we can use this for so much more, and it is not um, just OO language stuff, but um, other languages can use this as well. So in summary, that's a solid principle are more than just a set of OR guidelines. I believe they can be used for function programming just as well as uh, generic programming. This is universal ideas that help us to just write good software, software with loose coupling. And so use the solid principles to reduce coupling and also, of course, with that facilitate change. The single responsibility principle helps you to isolate change. If you follow the SRP, it will be much, much easier to change things in one place you do not have to change things in many places. The open close principle will help you to make additions. You can much more easily add things without having to make a lot of uh, modifications. The list of substitution principle helps you to um, think about abstractions in the first place. So think about what, is the what are the expectations on my base types? What are the expectations in a concept? These need to be adhered to. 
always. Then the interface aggregation principle, the special kind of SRP is about minimizing dependencies of interfaces. And last but not least, the dependency inversion principle is about steering dependencies in a specific direction. All right, and I hope you get a reasonably reasonable enough overview over the solid principles.